Picture this. Your postpartum, worn out physically and mentally, feel a rush of exhaustion. That's typical, right? You've been breastfeeding and your breasts are really sore and red. You're not feeling yourself, but what is that even these days? Then all of a sudden you decide to take a shower, hoping it'll refresh you. When out of nowhere, you faint on the floor of the shower. For Mama Katie Willey from Melbourne, Australia, this was a reality. She had developed a severe case of infectious mastitis in less than 24 hours, and she was not prepared for what she'd experience. Mastitis is an inflammatory condition of the lobes of the breast, and it can develop to be infectious, but this doesn't always occur. Many women experience it postpartum, but we are severely uneducated on what the symptoms are and what care we can receive for it. On today's episode, Dr. Katie Willey and her business partner, Dr. Elise Fuller, run a company called Your Two Jugs. Perfect, right? (laughs) It's out of Melbourne, Australia, and it's their mission to find tailored solutions for your breast concern. However, if you don't live in Australia, have no fear. They do have online courses. So listen in to learn what mastitis is, how to heal from it, and ways that you can look for signs for mastitis postpartum. You're listening to the Mamas in Training podcast, giving aspiring and expecting mamas guidance and community from moms who've been there. I am your host, Jessica Lorian, and I'm not yet a mom. An autoimmune disease has delayed my motherhood journey, so I've made it my mission while I heal to learn right alongside you all about motherhood. So together, we can be as prepared as possible, even for something as painful as mastitis. So here is Katie and Elise to teach you more. I'm Elise. And I'm Katie. And we're from Your Two Jugs. So my baby was three weeks old at the time. I'd had a lot of trouble breastfeeding him. I had a lot of trouble latching him, like waking up in the night to feed the baby and trying to latch for an hour and getting totally anxiety ridden, just, just trying to do that. And if I latched him, not trying to move so that, so that the baby would stay latched. And he, he fortunately was putting on a lot of weight anyway. I had heaps of milk. Um, and that baby was growing really, really well. But the, the anxiety of trying to breastfeed a baby, when you obviously have to do it every two to three hours when they're so small and your day being dictated by this anxiety, it was quite, quite harrowing at times. And by two weeks, my husband was like, I've had enough of this. We're, we're getting someone to come in in the morning. I, I can't, you can't go on like this. So we found a lactation consultant and she came out and she said, you're not doing anything wrong and he's not doing anything wrong. Try this nipple shield. And I did that and the baby latched quite well. And I was so excited. I thought, oh, thank thank goodness I've got a solution, at least for now. So it was the latch. It was that, that part where people say when the baby's born, you latch the baby, you feed the baby. So you know this process, but the process doesn't seem to work for you. So although you know what you're meant to do, no matter what you're trying, it's It's just too much. It's not working for whatever reason. You just feel like a failure because you know that there's other girls out there and you you hear it because they're your friends and you've seen it like Mm. with your sister four times that she was able to feed her babies. So you know that it exists and your mum's, um, my mum was very supportive of, of the whole scenario. Everyone was very supportive. So I was not being told to stop or anything like that. Um, I did at, one stage get told by a family member, you know, you can stop if you want to. I just had such a drive to breastfeed that baby. And yeah, it was really affecting me, but I really wanted to do it. And I really wanted to get through whatever this period was. I hoped it was a period of time and that I would come out Mm. the other side and be able to feed the baby. So she just quickly looked at what we were doing together and said, "I I think you're, I think you're okay. And I think he's okay. She said, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that's just not fitting together right now. He was quite a small faced baby. He had quite a little mouth and my boobs were huge. Like they, 
they were really <laughs> like just right out there. So um, she just felt like we weren't right now a very good fit for each other, but she was quite positive that he would grow into it. So that was, that was the scenario of getting the nipple shield. And then a week later from that, after doing quite well, like I felt quite positive about that and certainly less stressed. Um, and I woke up in the middle of the night with a pain, a stabbing pain in my left breast. By morning, it was, it was really quite sore. And I just kept doing what I just thought I was engorged because I'd had so much milk and I'd had troubles with engorgement. And then it kept getting worse. And we went for a walk and I'd have to stop for this pain because it was so intense. And then a friend came over in the afternoon and we're sitting and talking. She came to see the baby. And I ended up in the shower because I was just, all of a sudden just went so downhill. I was just really sick, really quick. To be fair, it was probably about 11 hours of it brewing mm. and passed out in the shower. And my husband was trying to help me in the shower. And my girlfriend that was visiting, he just said, oh, Bridget, can you please take care of the baby? I've got to help Katie. Um, so she, yeah, she just took care of the baby until we could get out of the shower. So that was the start of the acknowledgement of the mastitis side of it. And that was clearly a case of a mastitis infection. So there's two different sorts of mastitis. And then the infection one is, is always has more severe symptoms. So that night well, I was meant to go to my mum's house for a dinner to see an uncle who lives um, on the other side of Australia and uh, which is a long way. So we hadn't seen him for a while and I couldn't get out of bed. Like I, I couldn't hold the baby. My, the pain in the breast, when mastitis goes bad, it goes really bad. It is, it's got to be, I'm, I can't think of anything more painful that I've ever had. It is unrelenting and there's nothing you can do to avoid it in terms of like you're stuck in it until it goes away. So mm -hmm. walking around the house, the jolting, like even if you walk softly, the jolting from your foot landing on the floor would stab through my breast. It was really, really stressful. Um, and then as mastitis does, the milk supply drops, which is really normal. If you get sick, your body can't deal with creating milk as well. So you then end up in this scenario of stress because you realize that your milk supply has dropped and you still got this baby. On the Monday, I went to the GP and the GP said, are you getting better? And I kind of toughed it through and said, oh, I think so. When actually I was probably really sick. And so I didn't get the care I probably needed. And part of it would have been my naivety that I said I was probably okay. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, I ended up on another course of antibiotics. And then funnily enough, I had mastitis the following Friday in the other breast as well, but not nearly oh as bad gosh. a case. Um, so that was the inflammatory mastitis, which is the other sort, which is the most common one that we see. Um, and that usually clears up within 24 to 48 hours without antibiotics. And that was a blessing in disguise. So there's inflammatory mastitis and yeah. infectious mastitis, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Mastitis, yeah. correct? yeah, that's right. And determining which one is which can be difficult because the symptoms are the same. And so a lot of people mm. think that because if you get a fever or the flu, like aches and pains with mastitis, which are very common symptoms, that that means you have an infection when in fact it doesn't. They have the same symptoms. So we use other ways to try and determine what's going on with a person. And one of the things can be things like fainting, vomiting, really high fevers, like 40 degree fevers. So that 40 degree mm. fever I had lasted about four days. And in fact, my breast went black underneath. We thought I had an abscess. So oh it went gosh. very black and peeled the skin. And yeah, it was, it was quite the experience. So yeah, now for so. you, Elise, you know, you're not yet a mom. You're a mama in training like I am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> maybe um, one day, that's it. And so what have you kind of learned in, of course, hearing Katie's story and working with Katie and all the different patients that you've worked with in how we can prevent it or maybe we can prepare for it as best as possible. Yeah, I think it's important to know that sometimes things just happen and the body does need to go through mm -hmm. its process. But I think the the biggest takeaway for me I didn't know about mastitis and we only really touched on it very lightly at uni. So I think as I think as a mum in training it's it can be so overwhelming to hear all the things that other mums tell you and it just goes over your head and it's more about knowing that things can happen 
and you may not know exactly what to do about those things prior to having a baby or prior to breastfeeding, but it's getting that preparation that things do go wrong. Um, and it's knowing that there are people out there that can help you and perhaps finding out who those people are before your journey starts. So you don't end up, if that bad thing does happen, you don't end up in a state of panic because you've got no idea what's going on and you don't know who to call. Because I think that Absolutely. from all the patients we treat, that's probably yeah, I'd agree. the biggest one is that oh, I had no idea what to do. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know who to call. I just Googled it and I found you guys. <laughs> and yeah, they're just the ones who happen to live near us. So I can imagine this is a worldwide thing and perhaps there aren't services nearby everyone. But yeah, I think that's the biggest preparation tip from, from me. <laughs> if you get an infectious case of mastitis, one of the most common reasons is to look for a break in the skin. And because I've had so much trouble latching, my nipples were shredded. <laughs> so it's a really good entry point for bacteria, which yeah. is why it is really important. Like all the things that the LCs, the lactation consultants say, all that advice about mastitis that you see on Google, about get the latch right, all of those things, they are super important. There's more to the story, but those those small small things that are big things, um, those things are really important to get right to work on preventing mastitis. That's absolutely true because then you do drain the breast better. But looking back on it and having treated so many women's breasts these like in these last sort of eight years anyway, um, you get a really good feel for tissue and what the tissue should feel like. And my memory tells me that my tissue was not in good condition as, as a body structure, the breast at the time in terms of how tight it was. So there's a, there's a suppleness and a tightness to breast tissue. So I think that was one of the things that made it more challenging for me and made it more challenging to get rid of the engorgement. And then on top of that stress is it changes your chemistry as mm. well in terms of, um, how the cells function in the breast and funnily enough, how big gaps are in between those cells. So there's a few chemical things that happen in a normal physiology when you're stressed to the breast tissue. So I think that would have had a compounding factor towards this mm. as well. And we've seen that plenty in clinic when we ask women, oh, how have you been? Like, cause we obviously check in a lot of these people come to us early in their breastfeeding career and they're really overwhelmed. And sometimes there's other things going on in the background and the, the journey into motherhood isn't always smooth. And mm. when people get tired, it's really hard. I absolutely loved that you just called it a breastfeeding career because <laughs> it is. I don't even know if you did that on purpose, no, but no. it totally is a career. It's a job that yeah. we're yeah. working to perfect. <laughs> yeah, and it's full time yeah. job. And yeah. man, I, I love that so much. So what would be some things, I guess you mentioned that there would be some things that we could do to prevent small and then you know, bigger. One thing that comes to my mind is like, so say we're starting off on our journey and we do have those cracked or God forbid shredded nipples, like you mentioned, <laughs> you know, what it's can we do? Paying a good picture, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, hey, we, I just, you know, but loosely. no, we need, no, no, we need to <laughs> know me. that it could be that bad. Oh, it can be. Um, and, and a lot of the times it's not, so don't expect it to happen. It's not something that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's something that often happens. Mm -hmm. But but we see plenty of women that have a really good latch and still get mastitis. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not the only reason. There's lots of factors yeah. with, with shredded nipple, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on that, it's, if you do have things that don't feel right, don't brush them off as this could be normal. If it doesn't, you know your body better than anyone else in the world. So... If you feel like something isn't sitting right, um, I mean, breastfeeding is a learning experience for both mum and bub, particularly if it's your first mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important key too, because we can often just hear, oh, it's going to be painful. Oh, it's going to be awful. And so we almost would have pushed certain symptoms aside because we've heard that it's supposed to be this terrible, horrible, really painful yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame because some breastfeeding journeys start off perfect, like textbook. Yeah. And you might be that person 
that gets a textbook journey, that never gets mastitis, that never gets a blocked duct, that just sails through it and thinks, wow. And these people that get that and still don't like breastfeeding and these people that don't get that, like me, that are just so determined to do it, that you just put up with whatever. But one of the things that we have noted in our work is when we're trying to work out the recurrent cases of mastitis. So these, these women that end up, I had two cases, but I, I mean, although that's called recurrent, it was all in the same episode in a way to me. So I think I had kind of one sort of 10 day bout of things and then I never got it again. Um, but then we see some women who get it repeatedly. And when we say repeatedly, I did a reel the other day and I said something like third, fourth, fifth. Mm -hmm. You know, we get women that DM us that go, I'm on my tenth bout. I've had antibiotics. Of, wow. What do I do? So there's, that tells us that there's something going on in the background. And unfortunately, breasts are seen as milk making structures. Um, and the interesting thing anatomically is if we think about it, they were there before the milk making. So your breast had life before you actually made milk. That milk making, all the milk making structures actually develop through pregnancy due to hormonal control. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think bigger. We were discussing the other day an idea of foreground and background of the breast. The foreground being the milk making lobes and ducts and, and those structures. The background being the tissue that it sits in, like the house that it lives in. So there's lots mm. of connective tissue, there's fat layers, there's blood vessels, there's lymphatic vessels, which clear out inflammatory fluid and clear and infection. Um, so there's a lot more to a breast and where its connections are, because it connects into our, our neck lines in fascia, into our arms, into our diaphragm. And all of this stuff gets pushed aside for the milk making. And in, in our world, in clinic, that's a mistake because we find so many cases of this recurrent mastitis that we find all the issues in the structure and the tensions being held in the breast. So mm. it's, it's absolutely a bigger picture than a breast making milk. Now, what type of symptoms do you see that differ from maybe typical postpartum symptoms that we might experience? Because that could be another thing we could maybe brush off our tiredness or whatever as just, oh, we're not getting sleep and we're postpartum. I, I, I think when it comes to fatigue, I think fatigue's the hardest one because everyone's like, oh, I'm tired all the time and <laughs> my baby's up all night. Um, when you're ill... The fatigue is like, it's next level. Uh, yeah, like a truck's hit you. Like you can't get off the couch. Like you can't mm. get out of bed. You have to go back to bed. Um, it's like a flu. Yeah. It's like the flu. Mm. Um, okay. If you feel like you've got the flu, that's not postpartum symptoms. And you should look for yeah. pain in your breast and you should look for colours in your breast, whether you're getting a pink spot in your breast or a, I mean, women miss this. Like they yeah. come in and they'll say, oh, I was really sick. And then I noticed this red patch. So it can come. In terms of mastitis, it can come in varying setups. So sometimes you get the flu-like symptoms first and sometimes you get the breast pain first mm. or the breast mm. colouring, the red. Some of the things that we notice prepartum when we actually ask questions of women are things like, do you consider your posture? Like, what's your posture like? Because a lot of women or a lot of people, they just have this forward posture. So... If there's things you can do to improve your posture, that actually helps with breastfeeding. And anything to do mm. with motherhood is curled over forwards. You're either mm. changing a baby or you're picking up a baby or you're trying to get a baby into a car or you're breastfeeding. And they all end up in this very forward head carriage, curled up sort of posture. And that actually impacts the breast drainage of fluids quite significantly, whether it's milk lymphatics or good health from blood flow. We talk about that all the time. Let's work on breast health. And it's almost like these, these diagnoses of blocked ducts and engorgement and mastitis seem to supersede the overriding picture of breast health. Breast mm. health is where we, what we can do. And then all the other things that can happen to us um, will, will stem from how healthy we were in the first place. Mm. So... Yeah, it, it's a it's a tricky one in one regard, but there's definitely things you can do to manipulate your breast with your hands to, to set your tissue up to be less vulnerable is probably a better way to put it. We have a we have a heap of different 
techniques that we use that we've developed over the course of the years, many different techniques to teach women how to take the stress out of breast tissue and how to mass all, all different conditions require different styles of massage. Um, so we've, we've worked out different ways to massage each condition, looking at what's the background, what's that background in the breast in terms of its structure. And so how can we impact that? And the best thing you can kind of do for yourself whilst pregnant or even prior to that even, um, is to know what your breast tissue feels like when it's normal. Mm. Um, Absolutely. because, uh, uh, you know, you get to that point in breastfeeding, you're like, oh, I don't even know if this is what it's supposed to feel like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I don't know yeah. what it felt like before. So yeah, get in touch with your boobs, ladies. Yeah, it's it's really yeah. important. It's, it gives you a spectrum of comparison, and it's mm. that spectrum that helps you understand when something's not right. So feeling them, but I mean that's what we've been teaching women in our courses, but also in our rooms is going is treating them. We actually get people to feel them first. We're like, okay, I'm going to treat this, have a feel, and so they'll feel it, and we'll go, can you feel this, that, and the other? Yep, yep, I can feel that. And then we treat it. And sometimes it takes us just a couple of minutes and we'll go, now have a feel. They're like, oh, is that what it's meant to feel like? like <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people think when you've got milk in your breast, it's meant to be really firm and really hard. And that happens with a lot of engorgement cases. But we can work on engorgement in a room for 20, 30 minutes and they walk out completely different going, I can't believe I didn't know this. The, the biggest one we get is, why is no one telling us this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, I mean, how many women are breastfeeding? And how many women in their lifetime do, do breastfeed? And then you end up on the other path of, of, of quitting breastfeeding because it ended up too hard and it might not have been anything to do with your efforts and often it isn't. It's to do with how your tissue is reacting to the scenario of making milk. Yeah. Um, well, that's actually a great segue because I wanted to talk on this feelings of failure that many women might go through and how that could potentially lead to them, you know, starting the weaning process early or whatnot. So Elise, have you seen that with a lot of your patients? And if so, how do you recommend guiding them along through that time yeah I, was, uh, I think the hardest part is probably the mental toll and that one's difficult because mum's important so if mum's not coping she's not gonna be able to look after a baby so mm -hmm. sometimes it is actually supporting her to wean mm -hmm. as well and making sure she's okay first and foremost mm -hmm. But we see a massive shift and, and, and literally sometimes it is in the room with you as you're treating when mum understands what's going on with her, when she's got a plan to move forward um, and she knows that it's not necessarily her fault as yeah. well. So mm -hmm. that uh, literally, I've, I've, it's like seeing people come back from the den sometimes, yeah. isn't it? And we, we do, we do um, post-treatment surveys from our clinic in Melbourne and uh, just to find out how people, what they found most useful, there's always a box bottom, bottom that says, do you have anything else to say? And the number of women, it's so heart, like heartfelt in the clinic and it goes up on our intra message system so everyone gets to see what these responses are and they're anonymous responses. So many of them, like you get these responses like I was so over this and done. And I can keep going now. I feel yeah. like I have a new lease on this and I feel like mm. I have some empowerment in working on myself and having some, some control in how this, how this plays out. And I think that's one of the things, it, it's a very helpless situation when people get mastitis, um, because the information out there is quite, um, it can be quite vague and actually inaccurate as well. Yeah. So mm. there's some, there's some great information and there's some poor information. And at three in the morning, you're not going to be as critically an analyzing of, um, of that sort of information because you're just desperate for help. That's the bottom line of what we have. Like, yes, mastitis is obviously our big focus because of how much it impacts women, but really we're about breast health during breastfeeding. It's, mm -hmm. it's a 
bigger picture. Everyone needs to get that part that you have a breast structure that is connected to your body that isn't an appendage. It's a working structure with the system. And the whole body system needs to work well for the impact mm. to then be that you're in a healthy state that your body goes, yep, I can make this milk. So you need really good blood flow for any tissue in the body to get the breast. Mm. If you don't have good blood flow to your feet, people end up with lots of issues and ulcers and all of these things. Mm. And the breast is no different. And it's a very fine balance. Oh, and I mean, imagine... Like, you know, even when we have a cold, we feel pretty crappy and exactly. everything doesn't, like, things don't feel great, but you were literally left by yourself with no, not knowing when you were going to get better. You had no support. You had even medical staff around you who pawned you off. You'll be right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. or, or, or worse, they tell you to stop breastfeeding. Yeah. If you have issues, you're not unlucky. You just need to set your tissue up a bit better. Mm. So, I mean, if you had if you had something like a calf cramp, you would stretch your calf and try and get the muscle tissue to be more supple and and looser and lighter. And that's the same in the breast. Although a breast isn't muscle, it sits on muscle. The only muscle in the breast is actually in your areola and your nipple. Um. Mm. But the rest of it is very delicate tissue. So if you do go and massage your breast, make sure you're nice to it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> like that's that's such, tip number that's one. Such cool... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's none. such a good perspective shift. <laughs> and I think a lot of women can, you know, feel that urgency yeah. and the frustration. So they do probably maybe yeah. push a little harder than they even should. Oh, so. absolutely. It just doesn't work. Yeah. And you actually confuse the picture because you make it even more sore. And then you don't know why you're sore. Yeah. Right. Um, and then there's also right. medical staff, unfortunately, that still massage breasts with their knuckles. Oh, so mm. just don't allow that to happen. It's just not designed that way. And, and you actually can well, kind of not do yourself more damage, but yeah, you, oh, well, you, you can bruise the tissue. You damage it. You bruise the tissue. Mm. Yeah. Then That's... you're like, oh, am I inflamed or have I now bruised my tissue? Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Because both exactly. kind of feels the same pain wise. Yeah. So, Can you speak on antibiotics and if we have to go on them? Because I know that that can be a stressor for mums as well, knowing, mm -hmm. well, now, you know, maybe I wasn't pumping before, but now I have to pump. And how, how does that all work out? I think um, one of the first things that I think in life that's really helpful is what's your purpose? If your purpose is to continue breastfeeding and you have a case of mastitis that requires antibiotics, we think it's a really good idea to take antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Run the course. And expect that the antibiotics will affect your milk supply and know that mastitis also affects your milk supply. But then once that goes away, once the antibiotics stop, the breast is pretty, pretty good at recuperating its milk supply a lot of the time. Mm. So mm. antibiotics are an essential part of healthcare in terms of infectious mastitis. Yeah, but but the, yeah, they're, they're not the only thing you need uh, when it comes to mastitis. It's It comes back to the, is it inflammatory? Is it infectious? If it's infectious, yep, Katie's right. You probably definitely need to be on those antibiotics. But then it comes back to kind of severity of the symptoms and knowing that inflammatory symptoms do or are much the same as infectious. So you will get pain, redness, tenderness, sometimes joint pain, sometimes fever. Um, and if you know that the time frame that those symptoms tend to peak in is typically around 24, 48 hours. And if you can see that once you've peaked in those symptoms, that you start to drop down in those symptoms, they start to improve in that time frame. You're probably on the mend and you probably can avoid the antibiotics. It's when you're not on the yeah. mend, it's when it becomes super overwhelming, your symptoms are uncontrolled. That's, uh, we definitely always recommend speaking yeah. to your medical, practitioner. your medical practitioner for a script because there's no point mm -hmm. pushing through that. The thing about it though, the other part of it is antibiotics are great at, um, if you have an infection, mm -hmm. obviously, because they're going to help kill the infection help your body that way. The thing about antibiotics though, the thing it doesn't do is it doesn't drain the tissue. So mastitis is an inflammatory or an infection 
outside your duct system. So you have like loads that are like little balls that make the milk and then you have a duct system. So it's kind of like tree roots, but it's outside of that system that the mastitis is. So a lot of women sit there and go, I'll just massage, I'll, I'll massage this, but I'll massage it towards the nipple. It's not going to work because it's not in that system. It's out of that. Mm -hmm. So you need to mm -hmm. massage away from the nipple. That's something that we talk about all the time. Just as a basic mastitis treatment, you mm -hmm. massage away from the nipple, not towards mm -hmm. it. It may have started with a blocked duct that can definitely cause mastitis because it forms like a, if you think of like a river that gets dammed. So they put a dam wall in behind it, that kind of your blocked duct. And so that, that water from the river has to spread in, spread out into tissue. Um, mm. And that's what mastitis does it, but it goes outside that system. Yeah. So the antibiotics, yep, they'll clear the infection, but they won't clear the fluid. That's the inflammation. And um, so it is a kind of a multifaceted yes, approach. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. To solve exactly. that. There is more than one thing you can do, basically. Yes. But absolutely. <laughs> and, and the massage side of it is un unfortunately underdone mm -hmm. in many medical circles because um, a lot of these things have been medicalized rather than mm. looking at what's going on in the tissue. And there's some different types of techniques to break down that, that lumpy tissue, because unfortunately that lumpy tissue now has a vulnerability area if you don't get rid of it. So often women get mastitis in the same spot because the tissue's not right. What I love that you both have created over at Your Two Jugs is it's really these tailored solutions and, and you say that you guys are all about solutions for each individual person and so often the medical fields can just be oh here's a script here's this here's yeah. that so can you share with everybody if we're not fortunate enough to be in Melbourne and and be close enough to see you all in person how can people get some help from you all yeah so I'll it was basically the pandemic that pushed us to do this, wasn't it? So, um, um, some pros came out of the pandemic. <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, we, we did realise that not everyone can come to see us in Melbourne and mastitis is not uh, just a Melbourne-based <laughs> problem. Yeah. It's so, poorly managed, honestly. Yep, globally. globally. It's, it's poorly managed. We get so many women internationally asking us questions. So we put basically... Every technique that we've ever taught anyone who walks through our doors, um, we filmed them on video, we put them into a course, um, and we called it boobology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, study of boobs. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we, we've, so we've, good. we've split them up into the different, the most common conditions that you're probably going to get through your breastfeeding journey, which is, uh, mastitis, engorgement and blocked ducts, um, but we, we also took the care to put that education in it as well. We want mums to know that it is an, an, about the anatomy, it is about the physiology of your breast. We've made it pretty basic, hopefully, uh, for everyone to understand. Um, we put that in the course. We, we also address um, posture as well. Yeah, there's a mama's posture. Mm. part so that you can look for so the whole thing with the course was how do we give people because obviously we can't see everybody and time zones and all of these things so we were like how do we put this together that no matter what you've got you can look at our stuff and apply it to yourself mm -hmm. and so that's where the engorgement mastitis blocked duct stuff came into it like okay we've really got to address those three things and then we have a gamut of preventative techniques, which we use. So we threw that into a recurrent issues and prevention strategy module, mm. um, because that part is, that's the bee's knees in terms of if you've got recurrent issues, you just got to understand that it's not you and it's not that you're doing something wrong. There's something going wrong in the tissue. It's vulnerable. And so once that balance is a little bit upset, you end up with a problem. So we need more giving the tissue. We need to be able to have our tissue absorb a little bit more stress before it goes pear-shaped. And then we've got other things like a video on antibiotics and, and mastitis, when it's useful, when it's not. It was basically, okay, if we can't see you, yeah. how can we give you a plan? So every, every part has a plan, what you're going to do, how often you're going to use a strategy and what you're going to look for 
as to which part of the flow chart you go down. Mm -hmm. And then we also put together, we put together one called the blooming boob, which was, which is for pregnancy. So mm. the boob is... Mama's in training. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. So, exactly. And, and that is about preparation of the breast tissue. Mm. It's quite mm. short, but yeah, that's what you want. It's the heads up, isn't want. it? Yeah. That's what we did it for. We just like, for this exact... And, well, and got people holding their breast and yep. touching their breast right. and learning to know the differences between the left and the right. Like, yep. can you find differences? Because they shouldn't mm. be there. Right. So, yeah, just giving people, I think, some sort of framework to mm -hmm. assess themselves and then treat themselves. And you can do it. We teach people all the time. And the feedback yeah. we get on, on our courses is, oh, my goodness, I could do this. I, I personally have best friend who developed mastitis and she just felt so lost and oh, like totally. a failure and frustrated. And so for us to have a place to go for this is just so necessary. And the links to you and those courses will be in the show notes so people can easily access them. And I'm really excited too that you have an option for the mamas in training for the aspiring or pregnant women because I think that's kind yeah. of the number one takeaway if anything is, that's is the place before to you start. get there yeah, yeah. Yes. just get comfortable with yourself yeah and understand the tissue and it it really isn't a blob it's not a right. blob on the front of you and you can determine things and the more you touch it this is what our career is built on touching tissue and the more you, tissue you touch the easier it is for you to assess so mm -hmm. you get to know what things feel like, what they can feel like. You get different areas and you just end up with a picture in your mind of, oh, that's not right. That wasn't the way that was before I was breastfeeding. I can feel mm -hmm. that that's different. Mm -hmm. So we've also like just recently, we ended up doing one called Mastitis Rescue as well. So that is like the super short course on if you get mastitis, here's what you do right, right now. Yes, yeah. this is what you need. Are right you in now. panic mode? Yes. This is for you. Right. Right. We'll blast it that you're in panic mode so that you can yes. just start and have the right guidance from the get-go. Mm -hmm. To wrap us up, what would you say to someone who might be either thinking that they're going through the start of mastitis or they're in the thick of it? Don't massage hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep draining the breast like they say, but you don't have to do that a thousand times a day, which is also said. People get told, drain, 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 drain. Just stick to your normal routine. Make sure the milk is coming out. Treat your breast kindly and get some rest and get some help to come in with, to help you out. And if you're not happy with that help that comes in, get many opinions. You are the best advocate for your health. And if you want to learn about your breast and you want to learn how to treat the breast well in the right way, Mastitis Rescue is easily, easily followed. Amazing. Well, ladies, go to those links in the show notes to get in touch with Elise and Katie and all of the unbelievable information that they have out there. Someone had to do it, right? And we're, re we're really grateful <laughs> that it was the two of you because you also bring such a great energy to it all. And, and I think if it doesn't say it by the title, your two jugs, I don't know what does. So <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> ladies, I'm so grateful Thanks to have had you on us. here and, and learn from you. Oh, thank well, you so thank much. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. We have learned so much today. First of all, there are two types of mastitis, inflammatory and infectious. And make sure you're keeping an eye out for these symptoms postpartum. But most importantly, if you have the opportunity, get in touch with your two jugs <laughs> before starting to breastfeed so you can know when your tissue might change or be different from its normal feeling. If you do experience mastitis, be sure to also get the correct support. And when you massage, massage gently and away from the nipple. Most importantly, if you go through something like mastitis or any challenge in breastfeeding, remember that you are not a failure. And it's just that the pieces of the puzzle are not fitting together at this moment. If you need a reminder that you're not a failure and to help shed that mom guilt, then join us today in the Mamas in Training Facebook community. I guarantee that you will feel comfortable to vulnerably share your experience with a group of supportive women who many of them have even had mastitis and who have been there. 
They will truly lift you up and encourage you to keep going, if that's your desire. A recent mama posted in our Facebook group, I am so grateful for this amazing supportive community and I want to be friends with all of you. So remember, you are not in this crazy breastfeeding and motherhood journey alone. It's as easy as clicking on the link in the show notes that says Facebook community. And I can't wait to see you there. If you enjoyed the show today, new episodes release every Wednesday. So be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And help us grow our mama community by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. It also helps me know how to better serve you. Finally, I would love to connect on Instagram. You can find me at Mamas in Training Pod. That's M A M A S in Training P O D. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.